in the machine, that this theory is being challenged by the modern sciences of mind, brain, genes, and evolution, that these challenges are also seen to threaten our moral values, but in fact that does not follow. On the contrary, understanding what makes us tick uh, can clarify those values by showing that political equality does not require sameness, but rather policies that treat people as individuals with rights. That moral progress does not require that the mind is free of selfish motives, only that it has other motives to counteract them. Responsibility does not require that behavior is uncaused, only that it responds to contingencies of credit and blame. And that meaning in life does not require that the process that shaped the brain have a purpose, only that the brain itself have a purpose. Moreover, grounding values in a blank slate is a mistake because it makes our values hostages to fortune, implying that someday factual discoveries could make them obsolete. And because it conceals the downsides of denying human nature, including pers persecution of the successful, totalitarian social engineering, an exaggeration of the effects of the environment, such as in parenting and the criminal justice system, a mystification of the logic of responsibility, democracy, and morality, and the devaluing of human life on Earth. Uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. phrase in one of the earlier slides that said, study human nature objectively. Could you say a few words about that and how that could be better done by everyone studying human nature? Uh, yes. Um, for one thing, when it, all of the, the questions uh, that, that I raised about the blank slate, the noble savage, and so on, are uh, they're empirical hypotheses that could come out one way or another. We have I think good evidence for, uh, for some hypotheses, but um, ultimately the only way to find out is to look. And in, I think there's been a distortion uh, in many of the sciences that study human beings because of a fear that certain issues are, are third rails. You touch them and die. And that distorts the range of hypotheses that are, are tested. And the studies of parenting are, are a perfect example. Um, uh, the studies that don't control for heritability, I think, come to misleading conclusions, which then get translated into misleading advice. Uh, likewise, studies uh, in anthropology, I think that studies of uh, warfare and violence in non-state societies have been distorted by uh, the uh, belief in the noble savage, a, a fear that if you document uh, rates of violence quantitatively, you'll be portraying people as savages and therefore uh, saying that we can't help but kill each other. Uh, and people who have tried to document it often, have often been um, shouted down, slandered, censored, and so on, which can only, uh, I think, harm our understanding both of ourselves and of indigenous peoples. So those would be two examples. And I think in general, um, it's not that anything is going to be completely innate or completely learned. Completely learned is almost a... Uh, contradiction because you need something innate to do the learning. Um, we should have an open mind, realize that um, what we learn uh, doesn't directly lead to any policy, but has to be combined with some statement of values and a, a uh, democratic means of resolving them. And the more we understand, the better we understand uh, the human mind, the better off we'll be because the wiser our decisions will be. Yes. How much of this do you attribute to free will, starting from this heredity and environment and the individual using his reason to get the best results? Yeah. Um, well, I think the, um, there is a phenomenon that we label free will, namely there are some kinds of behavior that are involuntary, um, your <laughs> knee-jerk reflexes and um, uh, you know, particular strong emotions that we might feel. Uh, there are other aspects of human behavior that, uh, first of all, can't be predicted with certainty, and second of all, are responsive to contingencies of, uh, of uh, reward and punishment and other consequences. It's the ones that are not completely predictable and that are responsive to holding people, to um, 
contingencies of responsibility that we call free will, uh, the common belief is to equate free will with some soul or entity that's free of the laws of cause and effect. That's what I consider to be a mistake. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it isn't worth distinguishing voluntary behavior from involuntary behavior. And certainly we have to do that to, ha to have the maximum deterrence effects in the criminal justice system. You want to, you set up punishments to deter the behaviors that are most deterrable. Those are the behaviors that we tend to attribute to free will. And ironically, as Dan Dennett has pointed out, uh, that realistic, practical appreciation of what we want free will to do shows that the last thing we want is the idea that will is totally uncaused because then a soul that was truly free of cause and effect could say, I don't care if you think I'm a boorish cad or if you lock me up, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And that would defeat the purpose of holding people responsible. You want there to be some predictability, if only statistical predictability, so that holding people responsible will have the effects that you want. Yes? Uh, in the future, it may be possible for uh, technology through implants or some other technique to uh, take over more and more of the operation of the human brain and possibly the mind, however you want to define that. Do you think that that is possible? And if so, what would be the implications for uh, a theory such as yours? Yeah. Um, it, it would be, I'd be very foolish to say that anything is impossible, but I don't think it's very likely. Um, I think it's easy to get carried away by some of the techno hype of uh, roboticists that, um, you know, any sentence that begins, you will, or it's only a matter of time before, should arouse strong suspicion. Uh, the human mind is extraordinarily complex. We don't know yet how to duplicate anything in uh, any aspect of the mind in, in detail, nor do we have anything close to the technology of uh, a literal implant uh, in the brain that would control uh, the, um, the mind or substitute for thinking. There are so many boring practical problems, like how do you keep electrodes in place given that the brain is floating in fluid and moves? Uh, how do you prevent scar tissue from forming around the electrode? And it could be for 100 boring reasons, rather than any reason in principle, that a lot of these science fiction predictions are unlikely to, to come true. And my guess is that although it's worth pursuing, especially for clear-cut cases, like restoring movement to people who are paralyzed, that it, it might be worth pursuing. But uh, the idea that um, there's going to be a, a um, kind of a you know, Terminator or a, a RoboCop uh, scenario in which silicon will actually replace high-level neural tissue, I, I think is unlikely. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've just started reading your book, so I guess uh, you may have answered this question in the book as I go along and uh, get to the last pages. But how do you respond to the question of adaptability of genes to circumstances? in the sense that are genes immutable uh, over a certain period of time, because that goes against the whole evolutionary theory itself. So therefore, uh, because uh, the reason I'm asking this is uh, immutable heredity is often used as justification for relative uh, wrongs, like racism, for instance. And it's often used as an argument supporting inequality based on, on, on genetic uh, immutability yes. to circumstance? Well, um, I mean, genes are only immutable in the sense that Lamarck was wrong and that our experiences don't, aren't reverse coded back to systematic changes in the DNA that then get passed on to future generations. Uh, they're of course not immutable in the sense that they're constantly prone to mutation and recombination. Um, but the, um, I believe I addressed your concern in, in the part of the talk in which I discussed uh, inequality, and that is that if someone believes that there are innate differences among individuals that racism is justified, then they've made a horrendous error. Uh, that a commitment um, against racism is not a factual belief that people are indistinguishable. It better not be because people are not indistinguishable and we don't want to say that class prejudice or racism or sexism are justifiable. And the reason that we can have both uh, a, the study of human uh, differences 
and a commitment to equality is that equality is a policy, not an empirical hypothesis, and it's a policy to recognize rights inherent in all human beings, and it's a policy to treat them as individuals and not to prejudge them by statistics of a particular group that they belong to. Yes? I enjoyed reading both Wilson and Gould, and I remember Gould's uh, tax on Wilson in the New York Review of Books, and they always seem more like uh, debaters posturing rather than a scientist at work. And I couldn't figure out why he was, to my mind, so deliberately interpreting uh, Wilson in a perverse way in order to win debating points. What was going on in, in that? Um, I, um, I, mean, I, I, tend, I, I tend to agree with your assessment, and I document that in the, in the book itself. Um, I think that, that um, uh, Steve Gould and, and um, the other signatories of the uh, manifesto and the other attacks on, on uh, Wilson realized that it was threatening certain um, way of justifying political ideals. Um, it, it threatened the uh, utopian politics that were popular in the early 70s and, and late 60s, according to which nothing prevents us from redesigning uh, society to be better except a failure of will. Um, that uh, there are no built-in limitations on human nature that would stand in the way of uh, a utopia with perfect egalitarianism and nonviolence. The idea that people might have uh, emotions that erupt in violence or that people may not be, uh, people have a hereditary endowment and therefore it's possible for them to vary in small ways threatened, I think, this kind of uh, utopian politics. And a lot of the, the heat uh, that came from this debate, uh, I think, really came from these political concerns, which required, therefore, demonizing the uh, opponent to make sure that no one was in danger of taking them seriously. It was thought that a greater good was at stake. Well, a quick thing. I also noticed you didn't mention Freud or Jung or psychoanalysis, but it probably fits into your scheme somewhere. Which of the categories would that go under? Well, Freud certainly did not believe in a blank slate, and he, uh, <laughs> he, he, his theory endowed the mind with, uh, with many drives and motives and with, with subsystems like the superego and the uh, id. Um, and he also, uh, his theory resonates with one of the themes that I've uh, emphasized tonight, namely that the human mind uh, consists of a number of competing systems, some of them that tempt us to do uh, antisocial things and others that might um, suppress those temptations. Um, I think where uh, Freud differs strongly from what most um, personality psychologists believe now, at least those who have followed behavioral genetics, is the idea that how your parents treated you in the first six years of life shape your personality in adulthood. Uh, moreover, which I think has been refuted by the studies of adoptees and twins that show that the uh, effect of the home of the parents uh, is very small uh, to negligible. Moreover, the idea that was popular, uh, made popular by Freud, namely that psychopathology can be traced to parental uh, treatment, has been very clearly uh, refuted. The idea that, say, schizophrenia comes from uh, mothers who uh, convey mixed messages to their uh, child, damned if you do, damned if you don't, that, that turns a child into a schizophrenic or that autism is caused by uh, the refrigerator mother who is emotionally cold and distant from the child, um, a, a hypothesis made popular by Bruno Bettelheim in the Freudian tradition. Uh, we know that these are, are, are wrong, that these conditions have a genetic component uh, and they have some other cause which is not genetic, not how you were raised, and a, an important uh, scientific mystery. Yes. How would you expand on the uh, unfortunate notion that biology always seems to be associated with the negative, which seems to deny um, strong findings of biological anthropology, such as reciprocal altruism and things along these lines, where biology has, quote unquote, biological factors have significant positives? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly true that um, traditionally, Biological approaches to human nature have been uh, perceived as pessimistic, as, at, um, as uh, giving us a tragic view of humanity, of uh, emphasizing our flaws, uh, probably going back to uh, the characterization of, of um, uh, nature as red in tooth and claw. 
Now, I think that to some extent this is, um, uh, is justified that um, a belief in